Hello, listeners. Thanks for tuning in to our very first episode of The Spark, Medical Education for Curious Minds. It's our new podcast from UCSF's medical education community. We're excited to bring you perspectives and insights from faculty, staff, and students over the coming months. We'll be fine-tuning our content with each new edition delivered in your inbox monthly with the Team MedEd staff newsletter. I'm Megan O'Connor, Instructional Designer with the Technology Enhanced Education Group. And I'm Karen Fleming, Communications Manager for the Office of Medical Education. Stay tuned over the next 15 minutes as we hear from Dr. John Davis, the new Associate Dean for Curriculum, who will be joining us in July. In an interview with Associate Dean for Medical Education, Kevin Souza, John tells us why and how he's set to help lead the rollout of the medical school's Bridges curriculum. And you'll learn about his unique expertise in LGBT issues in medicine, what the hot buttons are, and why it matters to health professionals. Building on the theme of healthcare equity and diversity, you'll also hear from medical student Danielle Cypress, winner of this year's Dean's Prize in Health and Society, whose leadership in bringing more equitable care and women's health resources to Latin Americans has set her on track to be another UCSF physician who cares without barriers. So that's a perfect segue to our first Spark interview. Let's hear Kevin's conversation with Dr. John Davis. Good morning, John. I want to welcome you to the inaugural podcast uh, from Team MedEd, and we're really happy to have you with us today. Well, thank you very much, and uh, good morning to you, and I'm, I'm honored to be part of it, especially the inaugural. Great. Well, we have just a few questions for you today. Um, and I want to start off by asking you what drew you to the position of Associate Dean of Curriculum here at UCSF. Um, so I actually am currently an Associate Dean for Curriculum uh, here at Ohio State. Um, and so I will say that what I think drew me um, to the position um, at UCSF is really that it was a, a combination of my passions. Um, I love medical education, which is why I have the, the current position that I have. Um, but at the same time, um, UCSF is such a leader in so many areas, not uh, in the least um, in another area of my passions, which is in sexual and gender minority work. Um, so um, UCSF is clearly a leader there. Um, in addition, UCSF um, comes with what what I would say is uh, an air of excellence um, that uh, that I think many other institutions aspire to. And so all of those together um, really drew me to, to this particular position of Associate Dean for Curriculum. You mentioned that UCSF is a leader in the area of sexual and gender minority work and that this is one of your passions. I'm wondering if you could tell us a little bit more about that passion. Oh, sure. So um, I think my passions are probably like many others, uh, shaped by personal experiences. Um, and I will say um, that probably the most formative set of experiences I had was um, as a, a gay man growing up in Texas, uh, and in particular, um, being then in Boston in the late 80s, um, as I watched um, many members of the community uh, affected by HIV and AIDS. And in particular, um, seeing the effect of stigma and bias by some members of the, the healthcare system, uh, of the government, um, even members of the public. Um, and, uh, and, and that really was formative for me. Um, when I went to medical school then, I was fortunate enough to have a longitudinal clinical experience um, over all four years at an HIV clinic. Um, and it really demonstrated to me that I could uh, express some of that passion that I had formed, um, that desire for advocacy, along with my passion for medicine. And, uh, and so um, that is what initially drew me to infectious diseases and my interest in, in HIV medicine. At the same time, as I went through uh, my medical education, I was the only uh, out person in my medic medical school class um, and, um, and one of the few um, who was in my residency. Um, so I, I slowly started um, developing more of an interest in 
LGBT health and sexual and gender minority um, issues in uh, medical education. Um, and, uh, and I would just say that, uh, you know, though I think things have changed significantly since the 80s, um, both in HIV um, and in sexual and gender minority health, as well as other um, sociopolitical issues, it, let's be clear that, that uh, there are still parts of the world uh, where members of the sexual and gender uh, minority populations are criminalized, um, are tortured, even killed for their identities. And even in our own country, uh, you know, the, the rights and, uh, uh, and protections that are afforded to some are not necessarily afforded. Uh, to members of the sexual and gender minority uh, population. So, so this is still a very important issue and an important passion for me. Thank you. You know, it's clear that your passion has led to you being nationally recognized as a leader in LGBT health in the academic medicine arena. And I'm wondering if you could share with us some of the specific issues that are important to, um, to follow. Well, sure, and I think so. I guess um, following on on what I was saying before, um, you know, I think uh, in particular uh, one of the areas that I'm most interested in is trying to help address some of the existing healthcare disparities um, for members of, of um, LGBT and sexual and gender minority uh, populations, and I think one way to address um, some of those disparities uh, is by providing education. And whether that be medical education specifically or health professional education, and whether that be at the, the student level, graduate level, or, or even um, in the practicing professional level. Uh, we know that there are uh, members of each of those levels interested in learning more and and assessing themselves on their ability to provide appropriate care um, and in providing that appropriate care for sexual and gender minority populations that they actually provide better care for everyone um, and so that's that's really one of my areas of interest um, and i would say that again the the setting of ucsf in particular is one that that combines all of those the the excellence in medical education the uh, the environmental contexts um, that provide a really rich uh, background for um, for this kind of of I think of my passions and of this kind of of advocacy. Providing better care for everyone. That sounds great. Definitely. And actually, I found out that a lot of our student leaders are doing great work in this area. Fourth year medical student Danielle Cypress, for example, won the Dean's Prize last week in the Health and Society category for her research on the impact of race on sexual health and STI prevention strategies in young women. So, Karen, how and why might race decide that? Good question. Actually, Danielle does a great job of explaining. Uh, my name is Danielle Cypress. I am a fourth year medical student at UCSF and I will be entering the field of OBGYN next year. So when we talk about racial or ethnic differences, what does current research suggest and more specifically what does your research suggest in terms of young women's sexual health and preventative strategies for sexually transmitted infections or STIs as they're now known? So in terms of overall sexual and reproductive health, there are significant disparities in unwanted pregnancy and STI rates among racial and ethnic minorities, especially with African American women uh, experiencing these outcomes at significantly higher rates. Um, of course, these issues are very, uh, these issues are multifactorial in nature, and so in the case of STIs, recent evidence has been looking at um, the, how the prevalence of STIs within a community or sexual network significantly impact the chances that a woman may um, may be vulnerable to having an STI, even if she just has sex with one partner. Uh, we also find that relationship power differentials and also access to healthcare also significantly contribute to these disparities. Um, I think it's also important for us to recognize that 
that sexual behavior itself is a key contributor to these outcomes, and so it makes sense that prior research has looked at the individual factors um, and behaviors that young women engage in to put themselves at risk of infection. Um, however, I wanted to, in doing our research, I wanted to look at it in the kind of a different, more positive approach in that looking at not a, what women are doing wrong to make themselves at risk of infection, but rather what are they doing right to reduce their vulnerabilities to infection, hopefully take it as more of like an empowering, health-promoting approach. And when we talk about what women are doing right, do you see differences mm -hmm. across the board for different ethnicities? We do. So we ultimately found that young women are engaging in a variety of behaviors and strategies to reduce their vulnerability to STIs, but there were racial and ethnic differences among many of these strategies. Um, and so for things like you know, women were limiting their set number of sexual partners, they were getting them or, the, or their partners tested for STIs, you're having discussions about STIs. Um, but what we found was that, especially among um, African American, Hispanic, and Asian women, they were significantly less likely to engage in any, um, any actions prior to initiating intercourse. And so any preparatory actions that would reduce their risk of, or reduce their vulnerability to STIs, they're actually less likely to engage in compared to white women. Um, we also found that black women were also significantly less likely to involve their partners in, the, in some of these actions as well. You may have answered some of these uh, in your previous answer, but for women of color, what are some of the issues around accessing protection before mm -hmm. engaging in sexual behaviors? And why do we see these differences among the different groups when compared with, for example, Caucasian women? So absolutely. So we find that you know minority women seem to be less likely to engage in preparatory actions prior to intercourse, and so our study can't determine why it is that these differences exist. Um, but we suspect that it may be related to education about specific protective behaviors or access to certain strategies. So it would make sense that even if you know about the um, efficacy of STI testing as a treatment modality that also prevents the spread of infection. In order for this to happen, you have to have access to STI testing facilities and also have insurance that covers these STI, um, these STI tests. Um, I think that it's also important to, to consider the fact that you know patients may not feel able to advocate for themselves in their in clinics and in discussions with their providers or within their relationships themselves. And so I'm sure that, um, that I suspect that relationship factors also contribute to this as well. What are the issues around varying comfort levels in the different groups in terms of, first of all, talking to their sexual partners and also talking to their physicians? So more recently, research is actually starting to look at how to involve male partners in these sexual health discussions and decisions because they've often been left out in prior research and really just looked at, are women even engaging in any of these, in any of these sexual behaviors? Um, and I think that that's a really fantastic approach is to incorporate the partner and see them as a whole of two beings that are both involved in these discussions and these behaviors. Uh, so our study found that black and Hispanic women were significantly more likely to feel very uncomfortable with discussions about certain sexual health topics with their providers. Um, and interestingly, prior research has also found that Asian women feel really uncomfortable with discussing sexual health topics with their providers that actually leads them to be less honest in revealing their sexual behaviors as well. Um, so this is absolutely something that healthcare providers on our end can strive to improve, such as doing things like May, not making assumptions about one's sexual behavior is also ensuring that the patient is aware of confidentiality around the, di around the discussions, and as well as um, being sure to ask those questions without judgment. When you first began this part of your research, what was the most surprising, I guess, takeaway that you gleaned from it? I think the, something that was concerning to me was looking at looking at our secondary findings and finding that not only are there differences in what women may be doing, but actually also looking at our secondary findings and finding that um, there was a difference in what sexual health discussion topics were being discussed with between providers and patients, and finding that white women were nearly three times as likely to have discussions with their providers about using condoms and talking to their partners about STIs. And I think that that is, it's concerning to know that there might be having there might be different discussions between providers and patients of different races, and what we don't know is you know whether the providers are bringing up these discussions or if the patients are themselves, and that's something that can be further elucidated. Guys, 
And my last question, will you be taking this research to your residency and where will that be? I'm hoping to. I'm going to be starting my OBGYN residency at Northwestern in Chicago. Um, and we all engage in research during our time in residency. And part of the reason why I wanted to get started in this research now is so I could kind of learn what I needed to do to when I am a physician and I'm able to actually implement a lot of these, these new questions that we have for my current research. And so I'm very much hoping to find a mentor who I can continue this with. Fantastic, Danielle. Thank you so much for your time today. Thank you. Well, as we heard today, gender and race affect access to equitable care. Both Dr. John Davis and medical student Danielle Cypress show how UCSF is breaking down barriers to deliver more equitable care to everybody, regardless of race or gender. Thanks for tuning in to our kickoff episode of The Spark. Come back in June for early summer highlights, an interview with Susan Masters celebrating her career at UCSF, and news from our team. And don't forget to read the staff newsletter to find out this month's news, events, special announcements, and kudos. The music in this podcast comes from Poddington Bears Egress, licensed under CC by NC 3.0 and available at the Internet Archive.